Welcome to Weber Days at the Iowa City Public Library and our first WOW Weber on Wednesday event. During the month of May, the library celebrates not only National Historic Preservation Month and local history, but local historian Irving Weber. But before we start, we have so much information about Weber on Wednesday that I'm going to direct you to how you can find out what all of the events are. This is the Iowa City Public Library's website, and if you look here, you'll see Weber on Wednesday, and if you click on the banner up here, it will take you to a press release that talks about all of our events. Um, one of the things that we have is something called Scan It at ICPO, and that is where we help people digitize their photographs or their mm -hmm. letters, all kinds of things, and we're particularly looking for things that have to do with Iowa City because we would really like to add things to our digital heritage site. As you came in, I gave you all a postcard-sized recipe card, and on one side is Ginger Crisp, and this is from a recipe book that we have from 1898 in our collection, and on the other side is how you can get to the digital heritage site. And I just pulled up from that site a postcard that came from a collection of Bob Hibbs, and I put it up here because it has some pretty pictures of trees and a little bit of flowers in what used to be the boulevard on Iowa Avenue. So if you want to go home and explore the Iowa, digital, or the Iowa City's Digital Heritage Collection, please do. And if you have some things that you'd like to add, if you lived in Iowa City for a long time and, and your family came from Iowa City or Johnson County, you'd really be interested in any kind of photographs. So keep that in mind. So back to WOW and Weber on Wednesday. So why? Irving Weber. Well, Irving Weber, as probably you all know, lived his entire life and almost the entire 20th century in Iowa City. His family roots reached deep into early Iowa City. His maternal great-grandparents settled in Iowa City in 1839. Can't get much earlier than that, unless you're a Native American. His paternal grandparents came to town in 1857. Irving was born in 1900 the beginning of the new century. He was educated in Iowa City Public Schools and graduated from the University of Iowa in 1922. Weber is remembered for many things. He was the University of Iowa's first all-American swimmer. If you know anything about Irving Weber, he used to ring the bell at swim meets and um, he let us borrow his bell for a couple of our programs here at the Iowa City Public Library. I think the bell now lives at the Weber School. He was the founder of Quality Check Dairies and served as its president until his retirement in 66. He was an active member of the Iowa City Noon Host Lions Club and was a local school board president from 52 to 53, and in 94, Weber Elementary School was named in his honor. He might be most remembered now, however, for the 800 articles he wrote for the Press Citizen, beginning in 1973. Irving Weber's view of history was not a, one of a dull retelling of facts and names. He told what it was like to grow up in Iowa City, the best places to buy penny candy, the joys of cooling off in Melrose Lake in the summer and of sledding parties on closed off streets. He recorded for future generations the story of Iowa City as no one else could tell. In 1989, in gratitude for his work in recording local history, Irving B. Weber was named as Iowa City's, host, Iowa City's official historian. All of the articles Irving Weber wrote for the Iowa City Press Citizen are available online at the University of Iowa's digital library through cooperation with the Noon, Noon Host Lion Club, Lions Club and the Iowa City Public Library and Lolly Eggers, the former director of the Iowa City Public Library. Irving died in 1997, barely missing a century of life. If we have piqued your interest in local history or exploring your family's history, please take a trip to the second floor. We have many fascinating Iowa items in the Iowa City and Johnson County history collection and materials on how to research your family's story. And in fact, we're doing a couple of classes this month on um, using Ancestry and Heritage Quest. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Or if you'd like to learn more on your own, we can help you. Tonight's program for Weber on Wednesday is Plum Grove Gardens, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We're fortunate to have Master Gardeners Betty Kelly and Carolyn Murphy here to share, to share their stories of the gardens. Carolyn is employed by the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine Admissions Office. She grew up on a small farm southwest of Iowa City. Oh, I bet you've got interesting photographs, don't you? To talk afterwards. She's very interested in gardening, 
Iowa Native Butterflies Photography and History. Carolyn has been a volunteer at Plum Grove as a master gardener since 2005. She started volunteering as an intern and found it so intriguing, she decided to join Betty, another master gardener, in the heirloom, garden, heirloom gardens. She found herself smiling when she was around the heirloom flowers because it reminded her of her grandmother's garden. What a sweet story. Carolyn is part of the Plum Grove Garden Committee and co-chair of the Johnson County Butterfly House. And are you going to talk about the Butterfly House at all tonight? I sure can if people are interested. All right, well, maybe we'll ask you a question about that afterwards. Okay. Betty, um, our other volunteer tonight, Betty Kelly, is, was a textile chemist in an earlier life, and now she is a volunteer extraordinaire. Gardening is a longtime passion. In 1996, she helped start Plum Grove State Historical Site Gardens and the fundraising tasting party. She has been a master gardener for nearly 28 years and is a member of the Hostess Society. <coughs> Historic preservation is another interest that has stimulated her volunteering activity. She served on the Iowa City Preservation Commission for nine years and helped pass the historic district legislation. Betty and Carolyn are the perfect pair to help us honor Irving Weber's legacy and celebrate local history. Betty, Carolyn. Thank you, Maeve. Thank you, Maeve. If you've ever visited the Iowa Capitol, it was built in the same year as Plum Grove's house. And the reason probably is because Robert Lucas, who built Plum Grove, was the first territorial governor, and he laid the cornerstone on the state, on the Iowa Capitol. One of the things about Plum Grove is people wonder what it is. It's actually the home of the first territorial governor, Robert Lucas. Robert Lucas is an interesting man. He was born in Pennsylvania, and he fought as a general in the War of 1812. He moved to Ohio, and he became the governor, and he served eight years as a representative. And President Van Buren appointed him as the first territorial governor. Unfortunately, politics as it is changed, and he wasn't reappointed. It wasn't in great favor in Ohio, so he decided he would stay in Iowa. And he bought 80 acres of land, which is now four acres, is now part of Plum Grove, and he paid $200 for it. Pretty good price in those days. He left, he had the property in his wife's name. His wife's name is Friendly. She was his second wife, and he was, she was 20 years younger than he was. I think he probably thought, I'm going to die before she was. So he left it in her name. One of the things I find interesting is the fact that he stayed here, even though his political career was over with. In 1853, he died at Plum Grove, and Friendly lived on at Plum Grove until 1866. Then it changed hands a number of times. It was 40 years with the White family, 17 years with the Davis family, 16 years with the Swartz family, and the last family that had it mainly rented it out. Now, think about it. Would you rent this house? No water, no electric lights, and it still doesn't have water and electric lights. By the time of 1941 came, it wasn't in very good shape. It had been rented out over and over again, and it was deplorable. So, Carolyn, you want to show us yep. what it looked like? That doesn't look like Palm Grove today. They had extensions on it, and they had to do a lot of work. It took them three years to put it back into original position. But we are indebted to the two men in Iowa City 
who got the state to buy it in 1941. They paid $4,500 for four acres and this dilapidated house. And it took them three years to more or less put it back in shape. They had to take a lot of siding, a lot of porches off of it. And nothing was done actually to the grounds. They remained pretty much as you s they were originally. Some trees are appropriate, some trees are not appropriate. This last year we surveyed all the trees and there's over 300 trees at Plum Grove. Hard to believe. Many of them are not in good shape, unfortunately. And so it takes a long time. Today, Plum Grove is under the jurisdiction of the State Historical Society. If we want to dig a hole, we have to contact the State Historical Society or quietly dig it. And the Johnson County Historical Society has, is in charge of the house and the grounds. Now we have plum trees. The interesting thing about plum, plum trees is they aren't original. And they have had a chance of dying about every few years. We took some plums off of it and actually regenerated some new trees. Now why would you do that? Well, in order for us to get a picture at the Smithsonian, because we had we were applying for a national <coughs> Smithsonian Natural Nat Natural Gardener Award, we had to have the trees in bloom. So you had to have trees there. So we planted six more. Now, how did the gum gum the garden? The house was there. Four acres, no garden. There hadn't been a garden at Plum Grove since mid-30s. Well, I was on the, the, the uh, Historical Society for, uh, for Iowa City, and I thought, you have to have a garden there. So I applied for some funds. The state says, we don't give garden funds. So where you have a good idea, you have to have helpers, and you have to have money. Well, I went to the only historic group I knew, which are the Questers in Iowa City, and they gave me $100. That's how we started out. That didn't go too far. The second project for digging a garden is we had archaeology digs. You couldn't dig a garden anywhere unless it's already been dug. So the archaeologist that was doing that said, I have just the plot for you. And he gave me a plot next to the house on the south side. Oh, we were thrilled. And I think you probably, if you were there, remember what we dug up. It turned about to be the dumping ground for all the eave spouts when they redid the house. So we had a mess to dig. That's not a very illustrated start to a garden, but we did proceed. We set out, the garden is about 30 by 50. The first vegetable garden is 30 feet by 50 feet. Now that's not typical of what a garden would be. I'm sure Friendly, who was in charge of the garden, had a, eat a half an acre to an acre garden because in order to support a family, you'd have to have a big garden. But that's all we were allotted. We got the fence post from the extension office director and some wire and the front picket fence that we put in came off of my remodeled deck, but we managed to use a, to use a pattern that was distinctive for an early 1800 New England garden. Now gardens were usually enclosed because you had wild animals and so we have the back is wire fence and the front is picket fence. Now, we got the garden, we've got the plot, now what do we put in it? In order to be historic, it has to be heirloom vegetables. Well, unfortunately, when we started, you couldn't open up a catalog and find heirloom vegetables. They weren't popular yet. That's been a more recent thing. So we had to do research. Where do you go to research? Well, did Friendly ever write any letters about our garden? 
No. She never wrote a thing about her garden. Evidently, it was just utilitarian and not very good for writing gardens. So, we talked about seed banks, seed savers. In 1975, seed savers was formed in actually in, in Missouri, and then it moved to Decor, and they were very helpful. Also, the Des Moines Botanical Garden has a tremendous library, and they got a lot of information there. They also got a lot of information from the 1850 garden at Iowa, Li Iowa Living History Farms, which is about this period we would have. So, what's a heirloom? I mean, a vegetable is a year vegetable. What's the difference between a hybrid and a heirloom? Well, one of the problems is sometimes heirloom vegetables and hybrids aren't the same, but their name's the same. Often, two very unrelated heirlooms of the same variety. The thing is, when heirlooms were popular, many times the heat seedsmen named their own vegetable. That's the way I sell it. I can sell it better if I name it. And so it's very difficult to just say that particular variety was possible. It takes a lot of digging. So besides limited space and availability, we have to have certain types of plants. Now, and until about the middle of the 1800s, the root type vegetables, seeds, came from Europe. And so they would, hey, you do have to buy them from a, from a seed store that imported them. Well, not too many seed stores imported to Iowa. That's usually most more along the New England coast. But have we know, for instance, that they probably planted different types of root vegetables, beans, carrots, and radishes. Sweet corn is probably questionable because sweet corn was not really that popular until the Civil War, and then it became very popular afterwards. They did plant tomatoes. Tomatoes have been around a long time. So vegetable varieties that we ran across, some of them are called Tom Thumb, some are, some are called Merrill Squash, uh, silver tree tomatoes, white carrots, potting radishes, these are all weird name vegetables that we have grown. So, how do you locate them? Well, we have had a number of sources. The first beans we planted were given to me by a family in Kelowna that had been growing the same type of beans for 100 years. I figured that was definitely an heirloom. Most vegetables garden didn't provide much variety because people didn't have a lot of different types of seeds. So the seed industry really didn't take off until the second half of the 19th century. Most of the garden books, and I have one here from Barry, you can look and see, it was produced in 1865. He did, was one of the first people who really did a good job about vegetables. And he was also the first one that had illustrations or drawings of the particular variety. They are all sketched, they aren't photographed, but it gives you a very good idea. And he does talk about tomatoes. He talks about red tomatoes, he talks about yellow tomatoes. And we grow a lot of tomatoes. This year we are growing 18 different kinds of tomatoes. That's a lot, all the way from. And they're all heirlooms except for two. Two of them are the per new purple tomatoes, which have the same content that blueberries have. Nobody has raised them yet, so you'll be the first ones to taste it in August at our tomato taste. So what is really an heirloom? Number one, they have to reproduce from seed exactly like their parent. A hybrid won't do that because it's crossed with two different seeds. And it has to be introduced more than 50 years ago. Well, that's not too hard. You could still have a 1900 vegetable, but we're looking for 1850 ones. And the variety usually has a history of its own. And one of the most intriguing things is to look 
at the, or let's read the histories of them. One particular tomato was raised by a gentleman, and that's how he produced his whole gardens, by saying this is a secret kind of tomato. Can't find it anywhere. And he was, he, way back in the early 1900s, he charged a hundred, a, a $25 for a plant. Well, that's exorbitant. Who would pay $25 for a tomato plant in 1900? Some people did. And that's how he got wealthy. So, if you invent a vegetable, maybe it's a good idea to think about it. So, as you look at or laying out the garden, you can see that we laid it out in the typical cross pattern. We made, we made the piece, we deliberately made the path wide enough so anybody in a wheelchair could facilitate it. We only had the picket fence to the front. We opened the back up so people could walk around the back and see closer if they didn't want to come and walk on the paths. Doesn't give us a whole lot of room, but we managed to have quite a bit of, quite a few varieties. We try to change them every year, or we don't repeat them for several years. We do collect seeds, and we do teach people how to collect seeds at the tomato taste. So starting out with one garden in 1995, we started with the second garden in 1998. That particular garden site was also a very interesting one. It was the site of the second barn. There were two barns on, on the Lucas farm. This was the second one. Well, it wasn't too bad as far as the, con the dimensions were concerned. The only problem is, in those days, what you used for the foundation of your floor were cinders. And for the first number of years, we dug up these huge cinders, and they kept working to the surface year after year. But the garden has been interesting. When we first started out, we had a willow wiggle fence. We had, a, we had at that time, we had the availability of willow, which isn't always available, and we also made the arbor of willows. That didn't prove to be too successful because somebody came along and leaned up against it and down it came. So now, <laughs> now we have a wire arbor and we have a picket fence in the front. Now the garden is divided up into four sections and Carolyn's going to tell you about the garden. You Thank you, Carolyn. Do you want to talk about the taste first? One of the things that we've always had trouble with is money. Nobody wants to give us any money. So the thing that we developed, the, uh, the idea we developed was the tasting party. Tasting party is held the third week, a Wednesday, the third week in July. This year is July 15th. And we have 18, 50 or near that recipes representing what we grow in the garden. It's been very successful. A few times we've had to have it else, elsewhere because of heat. One year because of a terrible storm, which got devastated everything at the garden. But people seem to enjoy old recipes. And some of the things they eat, they haven't eaten before. We brought into this locality lemon cucumbers. People had never eaten lemon cucumbers before. And now you can find the seeds in the local nursery. Lemon cucumbers, for your information, are round yellow cucumbers. You don't have to peel them, and they have very few seeds. So, Carolyn will tell you about, more about the flower garden. I think my next slide, I actually put uh, an up-to-date uh, picture of the vegetable garden that kind of uh, gives you an idea of uh, Betty's artistic talent here. Uh, she does all of the uh, layouts. And you can see some of the structures um, that we use, the wooden cages for the tomato and the um, wooden trellis. And here is uh, another um, 
layout that Betty does so that we can kind of plan the garden, see what seeds, uh, what theme they're going to use for each year. Um, and that's Joanne Leach's hand. One year we had, a, we had a tomato that had a face on it. So we do have humor. <laughs> so I took a picture of that. And you can see some of the vegetables um, that we've grown. And here's Grandma's um, garden. Um, you can see some of the old time favorites, the uh, Grandpa Ott's uh, Morning Glory, the Larkspur. Um, and again, Betty does the layouts for the gardens. Um, and she did some cartoons there. I hope that's not us, but, <laughs> but it uh, gives you an idea. There's the picket fence that Betty was talking about. We replicated the uh, style, the peaks um, on the fence from the vegetable garden. Um, we did have um, a donation of some fence which helped us, but we probably uh, still had another third of this garden that we ended up um, having to buy. And um, Mike and Lauren uh, went ahead and uh, uh, ended up um, figuring out how many pickets we needed. Um, and we got them cut and painted. And here's a diagram of, of the garden and a mixture of pi uh, pictures to kind of give you an idea of the trumpet vine is always a favorite of people. Not too many people grow that these days. So uh, that is always a, uh, uh, something that reminds me of my grandmother's gardens. Um, and we have the Amish coxcomb. Again, uh, you can see that we've, uh, it has been divided into quarters. Um, so we have um, the first quarter over here, we have the uh, edibles, um, and we put in there uh, plants that people would have used for medicine, uh, for toothache, stomach ache, these types of things. We have the um, attracting butterf beneficial insects, birds, butterflies. Um, again, butterflies is what I really do like. So we, uh, in recent years, have um, uh, added um, a butterfly puddle, which we actually made. Um, we figured that what they would have used is crocs that were broken, and they would just put water and dirt in the bottom of them so butterflies could, uh, or other insects could drink, uh, suck up the moisture. We have used um, um, pots and turned one upside down and put a saucer on top, put flat uh, stones in there, uh, and dirt. Um, again, um, we use uh, flowers in this section that will, you know, attract butter, uh, will attract insects, uh, birds. Uh, mostly you're looking at hollyhocks um, and these types of plants. Let me get my drawing here. Um, and the other, the other side of that garden is the everlasting cutting garden. And you can see some of the plants in there include bale, bales of Ireland, uh, yarrow, um, tansy, uh, these types of plants. And the last garden up here is the fragrance garden. So um, plants that uh, are very fragrant we put in there. Um, we do have, um, let me see, we've got the um, tobacco, um, blackberry lily, and those types of plants. Now this here is a picture of um, the Heritage Party, and this is a mixture of a, like the last two years. Um, some of you may uh, notice um, Judy Terry there. Um, she was, uh, we were uh, celebrating Bill, uh, and he is on the bench. Um, the bench has names of master gardeners who have worked at Plum Grove, uh, who have passed, so we do honor them. 
and we always have plenty of great food. So if you're around in July, mid-July, this is an excellent event. Um, and in uh, 202, we added the wildflower garden. Uh, do you want to talk about that, Betty? One, several vis visitors to the garden commented the fact that why didn't we have wildflowers? Certainly they had wildflowers in those days, but what they probably didn't realize is people in the 1800s didn't think too highly of wildflowers. They were more interested in purchasing things that were more vivid, but part of the, part of the charm, I think, is looking at some of the flowers that would, would have appeared in the woods in this particular time. So we decided to have a wildflower garden. We got another choice spot. This was the dump. <laughs> we hauled away several truckloads of undesirable things in order to level off and have a dump. But I, it's really an attractive garden now. And I think people enjoy seeing some of the wildflowers which are dis unfortunately are disappearing. To, find, to go out and find some of these wildflowers is very hard, unless you're in deep woods. One of the things that Iowa doesn't do that Wisconsin does, Wisconsin allows plant societies to come in and capture the wildflowers before the contractors come in for a subdivision. This, some, this is something we try, I try desperately to do this, but unfortunately the contractors didn't think this was feasible. But that's the only way you save them, is to come in and get it before the, level, the land is leveled off. And in 2010, we added the uh, Rose Garden. Um, there's quite a story behind that. <laughs> we, um, the willow was breaking down, and so we needed to replace it, and we got together. Um, and decided that a picket, white picket fence would be appropriate and it was something that um, would look nice and maybe be a little more substantial. When we were digging um, the post holes, um, you know, we had to end up dig no, new post holes and um, we found a small cistern that was actually part of um, the small barn that was there. Uh, it, we actually hit it on the, on the uh, one side of it, uh, tapped it, and um, so we decided that um, that was an opportunity for them to make sure that it was uh, capped, it was fine, it was filled, and so forth, and um, which left us kind of um, a area of rock, and so we thought, well, you know, being master gardeners, we would make something out of that. And uh, the questers, uh, Betty had talked with them, and they were, wanted to donate some roses. So we went ahead and decided to take that area and use um, the brick that was left over from projects at the house. So it's old brick. And um, we made the semicircle and put the roses around and then added the, uh, the gate, um, which is pretty attractive now. That was the site of the uh, compost pile, so this definitely smells and uh, looks better than the compost. We still do compost. We did move it to uh, a place that's um, a little further out of the way. So here kind of shows you a drawing of what most likely the cistern looked like. Those were the ones that were being uh, actually uh, used in that time period. Um, and so um, we went ahead and put a drawing up at the, uh, uh, at the gardens also so people can kind of see the history uh, of what it would look like. You can see the uh, brick that we laid around and the beginning of the rose bushes. And um, I believe, Betty, that we added a new rose bush this year, you said? Okay, so. 
Okay. And again, that kind of tells you, you can see that uh, this particular uh, drawing of the um, gardens, you can see that we used uh, resources from Seed Savers Exchange, Terrier Gardens, uh, Select Seeds, Bountiful Gardens, and John uh, Shippers gar Seeds. Um, we do collect seeds, so that is one thing that um, we try to be as thrifty as we can. Uh, it guarantees us, too, that we are uh, actually staying with this time period. If we bought the seed, it pretty much is, so then we can uh, start seeds. At my house, we have um, already started uh, the Amish Cox comb. We've got uh, Sylvia going. Um, hyacinth beans are climbing everywhere. And so we do, um, we do start seeds, as, as Betty had mentioned. And one year, we had our visitors. Um, we were pretty pleased. And like I said, I was a farm girl, and I was really have never seen owls, baby owls, up close. Um, we had uh, uh, woods near where I lived, and um, I never, never seen them. Owls uh, actually have their nest down low. Usually, they're up high in a tree. You never know they're there until you see the young fly out. So this was quite an experience for all of us gardeners. Um, the first picture over on the right was actually taken uh, in March when Mike and I, uh, my husband, had taken a load of um, picket fence over to the gardens. We wanted to get started on the gardens, and this was in 2010. And um, so you can see we just saw them progress. Um, the one here on the left is is, you know, you can see that the um, fluff is disappearing. It's starting to get its feathers. Um, and then there's mom over there, or dad, uh, watching. And I think the moms are the ones that usually stay around the babies. Mm -hmm. So it was probably mom. And she did let us know uh, that we were too close. <laughs> So, um, you never and attacked anybody though. No, no, they were very good. The only time that we had her swoop down was the first time that we, um, we went over in March. And then after that, she seemed to be fine. We were, um, we didn't want to disturb the babies nor her. Um, we just wanted to take pictures from afar. <laughs> so we, um, we pretty much um, didn't go up close. Of course, we did not touch them. Um, those are things that you don't want to do with wild animals. And up at the top is not one of these babies. There was actually three babies. And two of them in this litter that we saw grow uh, came back. I'm assuming those are females. From what I have read, the females are the uh, ones that come back to where they were born. The males will take off and find a totally new territory. Uh, as long as there is a food source, uh, they'll stay around for a while. We, I do have a picture. It's not a really good one, but one of the neighbors at Plum Grove took a picture through her screen of uh, two young females or two young owls uh, coming back in the fall. So we really feel they probably were uh, two of, of this group of three. And the one up there on the left is one um, a year or so ago. Uh, we were at the gardens, and we just happened to be leaving. And all of a sudden, we saw this owl in the plum tree. And you can see it's in molt. Um, not real sure. I, we feel that it probably was born there, too, and had come back. But that we don't know. We did get rid of all the rabbits. Yes, do do that. <laughs> so do you want to go on with this one? This is a new project for us. And we've only had it for two years, but we're going to have it again this year. Yes, we are. It's a very interesting idea. It's getting people to taste different types of heirloom. And we try to have two of the different varieties. 
So this year we're having two white, two yellow, two striped, two red, two pink, and two dark blue. You'll be able to vote on the taste you like. The Japanese truffle won last year. But it's a very, we try and talk about great saving seed. We talk about, Joanne talks about the cultivation of tomatoes, which is a little different. Heirloom tomatoes are a little different than raising hybrid tomatoes. Number one, they bear later than hybrid. Hybrids bear and then they're through. They grow very rapidly and then they're through. Heirlooms start later and they bear until the frost and they grow taller. You have to stake heirlooms because they're very tall. Uh, one of the things I found interesting in, in the book, the old book, is the fact he suggested that you put a lattice on the side of your south side of your house and raise your tomatoes. And the, the warmth of the house would make them ripen sooner. I've never tried that because I didn't want to nail my house. But this is something to attend. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun, right? It is. It is. And you can see we draw a pretty good crowd. Uh, we have it on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, the 23rd of August this year. Yes. It, um, um, and as Betty said, we, uh, we do some seed saving techniques for uh, individuals that are interested. Um, Joanne and Lauren uh, help out with that. And um, so that is uh, always fun. Uh, we have quite a group of Master Gardeners, and it does um, it does take a while, or I mean, it does take a group in order to actually um, uh, make these events successful. So uh, there is a lot of participation, and um, I like this picture because of uh, just being a yellow tomato and with the. Um, the green tray, I, I thought that was pretty, pretty neat picture. Um, and there is Joanne Leach uh, giving a class at the tomato tasting. And um, Betty on the other side is uh, showing exactly how to save tomato seeds um, to plant. And I think that's all the pictures that we have. Um, we do have time for... Um, for questions and um, we do have list of uh, uh, heirloom seeds um, flowers if you're interested in that uh, we do have uh, the master gardener hortline um, cards here if you're interested in those and we thank you all for coming tonight don't we Betty Absolutely. thank you we have the seed savers yearbook up here we didn't contribute last Two years before that, we did contribute to the Seed Savers book, and I did send out tomato seeds, which is a job. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Oh, no, no, no. I have questions. Oh. So, but if you stand up there, we'll okay. do it that way. Okay. <laughs> you probably don't have questions because you're all master gardeners and you're familiar with it. But there it's Chris. I think it's your microphone. Turn them all off except the podium. Well, I don't. Something's in the room. So I'll ask my questions and thank you very much. And what a, I have gone to, I went to the first taste for the tomatoes and it was fantastic. And we'd raised, raised, we grew some of the same tomatoes and the one I voted for didn't win, but it was still, I mean, it was, it was a wonderful opportunity to taste those, particularly the heirlooms. So what is your source of water at the garden? We do have um, a hydrant there. Um, but that's Right. So, Carolyn, you're going to have to repeat. Why don't you both come up there? We used to, to um, haul it in, <laughs> which is a job because the only water was in the restroom, and we had tried a long hose for a while. So it was quite a thing when we convinced them to put water in. So you aren't replicating. We do have a water source now. What Friendly would have done. Uh, one year they forgot to pay the bill, but outside of that we have running water. Yeah. No, but what Friendly would have, they would have gathered, used barrels, right? From Yes, yes, rain barrels, mm -hmm. um, wash tub water, 
um, they would have probably, if the garden had near been near one of the barns, they would have used the cistern, cistern. to pump up the water. There was um, a cistern by the house too, but I know that one's filled in because I checked on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the state um, decided that it would that they didn't want to um, use the cistern. We we did ask um, after it was uncovered, and so um, we do use you know, hoses and, and watering cans. And then in the original, the, the house at Plum Grove, would the root vegetables have been stored in the basement there? In the cellar. Actually, canning did not come into Iowa until the 1900s. So they didn't can. No, but the root but vegetables. They did, they did uh, store roots. They have a they have a they have a cellar, this, and they have a it's a it's a dirt floor cellar. So would some of those vegetables have lived in stayed in the garden all winter and then, like parsnips, do they do they winter over? Do some of them stay? Outside of kale, I don't think you'd find any of them that would winter over. So when would she have started her garden in the springtime? She probably started the garden early in the spring. Like when though. Hmm? When would she have started her garden? Some things are, if if the weather is such that the snow is gone, late March you can, some people actually sow, in fact if you read the history of tomatoes, some people actually put seed, tomato seeds out in March. I cannot believe they germinated, but actually that was a recommendation they had. So I've how, never do, tried it. Do you know how she, how the garden would have been prepared after the, everything was harvested? Would, would they have done ground cover or? They generally would put manure on it. And there would have been horses. They had a good source yeah. because actually they, they did the butchering to the, to the, as you face the front of the house, to the left of the house because we had, when they were doing the archeology span digs, I was there and they, they discovered the fact that's where they did the butchering uh -huh. The barn was, there were two barns, one to the back and one where the flower garden is. Why they were so diverse, I have no idea, but that's where the two barns were. I actually saw the barn that where the flower garden was. It was a pretty bad shape when I saw it, because I was on the Iowa City Preservation Commission, and we went out and looked, and they decided that it was too dilapidated to try and save, so they took it down. So there was a barn there. That was, but the, the older, bigger barn was to the back, and that was long gone before the state took it over. So do you, other master gardeners, have any comments or questions? No? What, what kind of owl The question is what kind of the owl? Great horn owl. Great horn. Correct. Yeah. They're is, a good size. Huge. And, and what tree was it, what kind of a tree was it in? It's, it, it was a 125-year-old elm tree that had this huge, uh, a limb had broken off and it had just huge hollow in it. And actually it was low because I could see. Is the tree still there? Yeah. Oh, yes. so it could still The tree still is still there. there. I it's not going to be there a whole lot longer because it's in very bad shape. See the cutout of where. Oh, yeah, it's a fantastic picture. And horned owls can be very territorial. I mean, they, yeah. they're oh, unlike yeah. barred owls. He so. sit up in the tree all the time. The problem is he didn't eat all the rabbits. I had to bury it. The lot of carcasses. You gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. Well, thank we you very much. Other, oh. We had one other wildlife that raised there. Two deer came in and raised babies in oh. two consecutive years. And the neighbors fed them well, you over the back fence. And then all of a sudden they were gone and they accused me of chasing the deer out, but I didn't. They were afraid of the lawnmower. <laughs> Well, thank you both very much. That was a wonderful presentation.